Hive Mind Dreaming The Amazing World of Collective Dreaming Dr. Thomas Stark The New Gold Dawn A dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. John Lennon Okay, you want a whole new way of looking at reality. Nothing is more extraordinary than the hive mind. According to the theory of the hive mind, existence is made of nothing but minds, all packed together in the cosmic hive. Imagine each mind as a little sphere. We call a mind windowless if it is entirely self-contained and has no way of communicating with the outside, with any other minds. It can't see out, there are no windows, or all the windows are firmly closed and blacked out, and no one can see in. What is a mind like on its own? What can it do? Anything? The closest we get to this state is when we dream. In a dream, our unconscious mind serves content to our conscious mind. It's all about our own mind. Nothing else is involved. What happens if we open the closed windows of the mind? Then minds have a way of interacting with each other. Imagine that the unconscious of each and every mind can project some dream content into a shared mental space. What happens when all this dream content from all the different minds mixes together? What difference does it make that no particular unconscious mind controls the dream, but rather all the unconscious minds do so together? How does that change things? All the subjective aspects would be filtered out, leaving something that would best be described as an objective dream. An objective dream obeys strict rules and becomes rigid. No particular mind can move it. In a normal, private dream, our unconscious mind can alter the rules of the dream at will. Everything can change instantly. In a public dream, where all minds are equally contributing, this is impossible. Any one mind can't change the public dream. The public dream becomes fixed. If it changes at all, it's only according to the strict rules of the dream world, the physics of dreams. In fact, the public dream takes on exactly the same characteristics as the objective world, or what we all regard as such. That's exactly what the world we live in every day is, a public dream of the hive mind. It's not a material world, there's no such thing, it's a dream world constructed by minds acting in concert, and that changes the entire basis of what we consider reality to be. We're not the victims of matter, we are its authors. Matter did not make us. We made matter. We did so together, using dream physics, which is none other than the profound subject known as ontological mathematics. Think about it. When you go to sleep, you enter the individual dream world served up by your unconscious mind, and the dream world constantly changes during your dream. It's different every night. When you wake up each day, you enter the public dream world. This changes very little while you have been asleep and stays much the same day after day, year after year, as its own internal physics, the physics of collective dreaming, plays out. Therefore, according to hive mind dreaming theory, all that you ever do is switch from public to private dreaming when you go to sleep, and from private to public dreaming when you wake up. That's it. You are always dreaming, except, critically, there are two modes of dreaming, collective, public, and individual, private. They are experienced very differently even though the basic mathematics of each is identical. The only thing that changes is the number of minds involved in producing the dream, and that makes all the difference. Here's the thing. No one believes that the individual dream worlds they create when they go to sleep are real, objective, material worlds. They understand they are purely mental. However, while you are in the dream, the constructed world seems totally real, totally convincing, totally solid and concrete. While you are in a private dream, you never suspect that it's anything other than a typical, solid world. In other words, you can have the complete experience of a matter, while definitively not being in a material world. Now think about the waking world. The difference between this and the worlds you create in your sleep is that all minds are involved in its construction. What you currently think of as the real, objective, material world is nothing of the kind. It is in fact a real, objective, mental world. 
There is no matter. There is only mental content that you have been told to believe is matter. It's not. There's no such thing as matter. There is only dream content, collective dream content, that obeys collective rules, and seems solid and concrete. You have been told by science that you live in a material world and there is no such thing as mind. The exact opposite is true. You live in a mental world, and what you imagine to be matter is collective mental content obeying strict group rules, which turn out to be those of mathematics, which is exactly why science is completely based on mathematics. Hive mind dreaming theory gets rid of science and materialism and replaces it with mathematics and idealism, everything is about the mind. You can't get any more radical than that. You are nothing but a dreamer. Dreams are all there are. When you die, all this means is that the body you possessed, the avatar, is no longer functional within the dream. It has worn out, or been damaged, or become diseased, or whatever, all according to the objective rules of the objective dream. Having suffered the death of your body, you temporarily leave the collective hive dream and are temporarily locked in your private dream space, until such time as you acquire a new avatar. This is what is commonly known as reincarnation. It is nothing spooky and mystical. It's just a mathematical procedure that we have all been through many times. Before. A specific mathematical function exists for docking an individual mind to a body, avatar, in the collective dream world. All manner of mathematical subroutines, mathematical archetypes, exist for allowing mind to control matter, bodies. These enabling functions, all coded mathematically, are all you need to replicate everything that science claims is going on. There is actually no material world. There is just one cosmic hive mind and it does everything. You are one of its nodes. You always have been and you always will be. You will suffer avatar death countless times, but you will never suffer actual death, i.e. the permanent annihilation of your mind. Reincarnation is just one of many mathematical functions linking private minds to public bodies. The ultimate task is to find out what all of these functions are. Once we control these, we will have total control of reality. Your private dreams are replaced every night. When it comes to the public dream, it lasts as long as the entire hive life cycle. It dies at the end of the cycle and then it reincarnates via a specific mathematical procedure, which is none other than what scientists refer to as the Big Bang. This is where all the individual hive minds fully open their windows, so to speak, and start sharing, all at once, their dream content, which is all based on mathematics, just as in video game worlds. This shared content initially explodes, it's complete mayhem, and then it gradually settles down and stabilizes, producing the familiar universe of our experience. The world is simply a mental construct, a holographic projection beamed from the hive mind. It's a hologram that we misinterpret as a material world. There is no matter. There is only mind and mental content produced by mind. There is just hive mind and what the hive mind produces, individually and collectively. God is the hive mind in a particular mathematical state, that of exactly zero entropy. The world is the hive mind's entropic product. How do we link the hive mind to Freudian and Jungian psychology? Freud regarded the psyche as made up of three interacting elements, the conscious, the preconscious and the unconscious. The conscious mind consists of all the mental processes of which we are aware. The preconscious mind is a kind of waiting room of possible contents of consciousness. They can be brought into consciousness at any time if they succeed in attracting the eye of the conscious. The unconscious mind comprises mental processes that are inaccessible to consciousness. Nevertheless, they influence our judgments, feelings, and behavior. In fact, Freud considered the unconscious mind to be the primary source of human behavior. Like an iceberg, the most important part of the mind is below the surface. Its operations are beyond our awareness. Freud used this iceberg analogy for the psyche, with consciousness merely being the tip appearing above the surface. Freud then added three more components of the psyche, one, the ID is the 
primitive and instinctual part of the mind, containing our most basic drives, especially regarding sex and aggression, and also hidden and repressed memories. 2. The superego is the moral conscience and rules of society, and 3. The ego is the realistic, practical aspect that mediates between the conflicting wants and needs of the ID and the superego. Freud regarded the ID as entirely unconscious whilst the ego and superego both have conscious, preconscious, and unconscious aspects. The preconscious and unconscious can be grouped together as the personal unconscious. Carl Jung then added another level, the most interesting level of all, one that never occurred to Freud, the collective unconscious. In the hive mind dreaming theory, it's the collective unconscious, linking all the minds in the hive, that produces the collective dream, the objective public dream, the world. The personal unconscious produces private dreams while the collective unconscious produces the public dream. Our conscious mind simply switches between what our personal unconscious serves up, during sleep, and what the collective unconscious serves up, during waking. That's it. It's the simplest possible system. Nothing is as simple as the hive mind. It's extraordinary that humanity has failed to understand that this is how reality works. Once you grasp that everything is about dreaming, your whole approach to reality changes. Everything changes. What is the purpose of the hive mind? It's to achieve the perfect collective dream, heaven, and that's exactly what it accomplishes at the end of the universe. Heaven is attained, and then the dream begins again. A new dream, a new world. Although every cosmic dream is different, it always ends the same way, in perfect heaven. Yet it also begins the same way, as hell, the Big Bang, the cosmic inferno. We are all guaranteed to reach perfection. It's baked in. Yet we all have to go through hell to get there, as we all know. There is a general heaven and also a particular heaven. The general heaven is where we all enjoy bliss together. Particular heaven is where we personally reunite with our most loved ones, our family, our best friends, our lovers, our fondest pets, and so on. We are all fated to meet our soul mates over and over again through the life cycle of the cosmos, and our relationships gets closer and closer, more and more intense, every time. Nothing is as wondrous as the hive mind. The collective unconscious is God, the creator of the world, while the personal unconscious is the individual creator, of our private dream world. We differ from God only in degree, not in kind. God is simply the whole collection of minds like ours. When all minds operate together, they are God. When they operate separately, they are non-God. Non-God is the state of isolation, of fragmentation and isolation. God has low entropy, indeed zero entropy in its perfect state, while non-God is highly entropic. Entropy is as close as it gets to the devil and evil. Entropy is a measure of Satanism. The critical difference between Jung and Freud lay in the concept of the collective, or transpersonal, unconscious. The existence of this level of the psyche means that all minds have a common repository of deep content, and also that they can operate together as a single unity. The sole reason why there is a transpersonal, objective world is that the collective unconscious exists. It is the collective mind, not matter, that creates the objective world. Science has got it all wrong. Quantum mechanics, with its ideas of non-locality, entanglement and instantaneous communication, proves the existence of the transpersonal mind, but scientific materialism systematically misinterprets the true meaning of quantum mechanics, which is of course all about reality being composed of wave functions generated by the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious not only generates the shared world we all encounter, it also generates shared mental entities which Jung called archetypes, that help us to navigate the world. Our personality has access to all of these. These are images, thoughts, programs, mental subroutines, which have universal meaning across all cultures and show up in dreams, literature, art religion, indeed everywhere. Humans are able to understand each other because we have in common the universal language of archetypes. Ants and bees in their colonies enact incredibly complex behavior, Virtually all of it driven by ant archetypes and their shared colony mind, centered on the queen. 
The conformity archetype we use in the world is called the persona, the mask. This is the outward face we present to the world, and it is heavily curated to fit in. It conceals our real self, what we're really thinking. Without it, we would all be at each other's throats, constantly insulting each other. Thanks to the persona, everyone is an actor in public, and very different behind the scenes. The self is the unity archetype. The shadow is the division archetype. The anima slash animus is the harmony archetype. The archetypes give us our basic way of operating in the world. Animals exist overwhelmingly at the archetypal, instinctual level, which is why they operate so stereotypically and have so little control over the general environment, only over their particular, instinctual environment. Humans are powerfully influenced by archetypes, yet we also have the means to adapt them. We can learn. We can move out from particular environments and master the general environment. Yet this learning capacity is exactly what causes us so much distress. In The Undiscovered Self, Jung wrote, nothing estranges man more from the ground plan of his instincts than his learning capacity, which turns out to be a genuine drive toward progressive transformations of human modes of behavior. It, more than anything else, is responsible for the altered conditions of our existence and the need for new adaptations which civilization brings. It is also the source of numerous psychic disturbances and difficulties occasioned by man's progressive alienation from his instinctual foundation, i.e., by his uprootedness and identification with his conscious knowledge of himself, by his concern with consciousness at the expense of the unconscious. The result is that modern man can know himself only in so far as can become conscious of himself. You have to bring the unconscious into consciousness. You have to make peace with the archetypes. In fact, there are archetypes for helping us to access higher states and become higher humanity, but we must deal with the lower archetypes first. The Decision Maker Victor E. F. Frankel wrote, that which decides whether an experience will become conscious or will remain unconscious is itself unconscious. At first sight, this is one of the most insightful statements ever made. But is it actually true? If you imagine the Freudian preconscious as a repository of things that could readily be conscious but are not yet conscious, as opposed to unconscious things that will either never be conscious, or can only be brought into consciousness with extreme difficulty, then it becomes obvious that consciousness is continually scanning the preconscious, precisely in order to decide what to make conscious. Frankel, therefore, should have written, that which decides whether an experience will become conscious or will remain unconscious is itself conscious. After all, if it wasn't conscious, how could it pull it into consciousness? Think of it in terms of signal and noise. Signal is consciousness and noise is the preconscious. Consciousness continually searches the noise to see if anything is happening there that should be converted into consciousness. An analogy we have used before is that if you are talking to someone at a party and you are becoming bored with the conversation, the signal, you start to tune into the conversations around you, the noise, in order to find a better conversation, to which to migrate. Consciousness is always looking for new material, so is always scanning the noise, the unconscious, for whatever might be useful and better than what is currently in consciousness. The preconscious is like a limbo or vestibule full of thoughts pushing towards consciousness and perhaps even encroaching into consciousness. Consciousness is dimly aware of each thing. If it pays attention to the thing with any degree of seriousness, that thing has therefore entered consciousness. If not, it doesn't. It might enter consciousness very briefly and then vanish again. If you think of your own consciousness, you will have all sorts of strands going on at once, songs, jokes, thoughts about people, reveries about this, that and the other. Only now and again will you achieve sustained consciousness regarding just one single subject. We have to concentrate very hard to produce our books and avoid getting distracted. Smartphones are making it harder and harder for people to focus. The Dream Machine William Burroughs often wrote about the Dream Machine, a rotating cylinder of light that can supposedly induce incredible visions. Burroughs himself used a dream machine to inspire the extraordinary imagery that fills his novels. 
There was once a hope that every home in America would have a dream machine instead of a TV set. Imagine how different things would be if that had happened. Kurt Cobain was a big fan of the dream machine. The Collective Unconscious The collective unconscious provides both a shared, physical, world, a world of matter, and a shared, psychic, world, a world of mental archetypes that can link to both the organic and inorganic worlds. The collective unconscious is the most powerful force in existence. It's God. It links everything. It is the medium that brings everything together. It is the ultimate answer for all action at a distance. Physicist Oliver Lodge wrote, wherever one body apparently acts on another at a distance, we are irresistibly compelled to look for a connecting medium. This question of the connecting medium goes to the foundations of physics. Whenever you require a paradigm shift, you have to look at whatever the current establishment believes unchallengeable, and then challenge it. In the hive mind model of reality, mind provides two paths between things, an extended, physical, space-time path and an unextended. Non-physical, non-space-time path, a singularity path. The first path conforms to Oliver Lodge's requirement, the second path does not. There is no physical connecting medium in the second case because everything is automatically mentally connected. This is the whole basis of the collective unconscious, which interacts with everything in existence because everything is part of it, and it's a singularity, not a space-time entity. Descartes said that there were two orders of existence, unextended, mental, and extended, material. In order to explain how they interacted, he had another idea that has never been properly understood, except by us. It's not that we are better than Descartes, it's that we have access to the mathematics, ontological Fourier mathematics, holography and quantum mechanics, that is needed to make rigorous sense of what he was talking about. Had he known about these subjects, he would have nailed everything back in the 17th century. The horror is that so many people today imagine. Descartes was refuted. In fact, he was never understood. Outside our circle, he still isn't. Descartes' key statement describing the interaction of matter and mind, body and soul, was this, Indeed it is in no other way that I now understand the mind to be coextensive with the body, whole in the whole, and whole in any of its parts. When the same idea is applied to God, God is whole in the whole universe, and whole in any part of the universe. This is the doctrine of holomerism, the whole in every part. It is precisely the mathematics of holomerism that has never been understood by mainstream humanity, and scientists in particular. This is exactly the mathematics of the hive mind, the perfect Cartesian system, both extended and unextended and fully interactive, but with the extraordinary proviso that all extended activity is just a well-founded mathematical illusion, i.e. The extended stuff never in fact leaves the singularity, in exactly the same. Way as your private dreams never burst out of your mind into the surrounding world, even though you can dream up vast extended worlds. Although they are extended, they are extended in a very particular way, from a certain perspective. When you look at them from a higher perspective, the extension vanishes. This is effectively what Einstein's theory of relativity is all about. To properly understand Einstein's theories, you have to consider the theory from the perspective of light not from the perspective of space-time, yet that's exactly the perspective physics forbids, because it overthrows scientific materialism. Einstein's theories are pure holomerism, but we alone have understood this. Holomerism is how you unify general relativity and quantum mechanics, but there is no scientist on Earth working on holomerism, which is to say on hive mind theory, the theory of a cosmic mind made of light. Light is pure math. Light is all about sinusoidal waves generated by Euler's formula. In Jungian terms, we simply replace God by the collective unconscious. The collective unconscious is fully present in every part of the universe, which means that everything is connected by that means, unconsciously. As it turns out, the mechanism proposed by Descartes is exactly what underlies quantum mechanics, the basis of modern physics, but that's an advanced mathematical topic that we shall not address here. Suffice to say that the hive mind, the collective unconscious and quantum mechanics all fit together perfectly. X-rays Simone Natale wrote, 
On December 28, 1895, the German physicist Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen sent to the press of the University of Würzburg a brief publication describing the discovery he had made in the previous months, while experimenting on cathodic rays. His article, titled On a New Kind of Rays, referred to the new phenomenon with the letter X, since several questions about its origins and properties were yet to be answered. The popular press and the public were also gripped by experiments with X-rays. In 1896, the news of Röntgen's discovery started a variety of crazes that exceeded by far the reaction to other contemporary inventions, such as cinema. As the British Quarterly Review pointed out in April 1896, a scientific discovery had never so completely and irresistibly taken the world by storm. X-rays exercised a profound power over the human imagination. People imagined having X-ray eyes and seeing through people's clothes. And even seeing into their minds. It also occurred to them that rays of this kind might allow them to see the foundations of existence, and even God himself. In the 19th century, the ether was conceived as an invisible and all-embracing substance serving as the medium through which heat, light, electricity, and magnetism moved, as well as anything else as yet undiscovered. The ether came to play a vital, bridging role between the supernatural and science. It dominated both psychical and physical research between the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Both X-rays and wireless telecommunications, associated with invisible forces that were able to affect reality at a distance, were thought to pave the way for telepathy, distant perception, thought transference, and mind reading. Psychical researchers were convinced that the new technologies would at last unlock the secret of mind reading, including reading the minds of the dead in the spiritual world, which was thought linked to the normal world via the ether. The ether was conceived in space-time terms. It's now clear that the ether is not in space-time at all. It's a singularity. In fact, it's the collective unconscious. This means that it is mental, not physical, and that it is not amenable to physical, scientific manipulation, or at least not in any straightforward way. Mark Twain wrote. I once made a great discovery, the discovery that certain sorts of thing which, from the beginning of the world, had always been regarded as merely curious coincidences, that is to say, accidents, were no more accidental than is the sending and receiving of a telegram an accident. I made this discovery 16 or 17 years ago, and gave it a name, mental telegraphy. It is the same thing around the outer edges of which the Psychical Society of England began to group and play with, four or five years ago, and which they named telepathy. Within the last two or three years they have penetrated toward the heart of the matter, however, and have found out that mind can act upon mind in a quite detailed and elaborate way over vast stretches of land and water. And they have succeeded in doing, by their great credit and influence, what I could never have done, they have convinced the world that mental telegraphy is not a jest, but a fact, and that it is a thing not rare, but exceedingly common. They have done our age a service, and a very great service, I think. Twain's was the last great religious age, the age when it was believed that science had at last combined with religion rather than opposing it. Carl Jung's concept of synchronicity involves a form of telepathy. In his book Synchronicity, Jung wrote, My example concerns a young woman patient who, in spite of efforts made on both sides, proved to be psychologically inaccessible. The difficulty lay in the fact that she always knew better about everything. Her excellent education had provided her with a weapon ideally suited to this purpose, namely a highly polished Cartesian rationalism with an impeccably geometrical idea of reality. After several fruitless attempts to sweeten her rationalism with a somewhat more human understanding, I had to confine myself to the hope that something unexpected and irrational would turn up, something that would burst the intellectual retort into which she had sealed herself. Well, I was sitting opposite her one day, with my back to the window, listening to her flow of rhetoric. She had an impressive dream the night before, in which someone had given her a golden scarab, a costly piece of jewelry. While she was still telling me this dream, I heard something behind me gently tapping on the window. I turned round and saw that it was a fairly large flying insect that was knocking against the window pane from outside in the obvious effort to get into the dark room. This seemed to me very 
strange. I opened the window immediately and caught the insect in the air. As it flew in. It was a scarabeid beetle, or common rose chafer, Cetonia aurata, whose gold-green color most nearly resembles that of a golden scarab. I handed the beetle to my patient with the words, here is your scarab. This experience punctured the desired hole in her rationalism and broke the ice of her intellectual resistance. The treatment could now be continued with satisfactory results. What happened here? Jung was desperate to make a breakthrough in the treatment of this intractable woman. Jung's unconscious detected a nearby scarab beetle and summoned it. This was exactly what was required to demonstrate that the world is much more mysterious than the patient had ever imagined. Nikola Tesla once said, the day science begins to study non-physical phenomena, it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. That's absolutely true, and hive mind theory is what must be used to explain non-physical phenomena. The Spiritual Fashion In the 19th century, spiritualism became the fashion of the age. Spiritualism was a system of belief or religious practice based on supposed communication with the spirits of the dead, through mediums, and grounded in the philosophical doctrine that the spirit exists separately from matter, or indeed that spirit is the only true reality. Spiritualism was a kind of scientific religion since it was inspired by the latest discoveries regarding electricity, electromagnetism, X-rays, wireless communication, and the supposed invisible ether connecting everything. Spiritualism, unlike conventional religion, was fueled by technology, not faith. That's what allowed it to capture the imagination of the world. It was a step up from mere belief. Now scientific proof of the afterlife was thought possible. Spiritualists were particularly keen to photograph ghosts and spirits, and a huge industry in faking it began, which more or less paved the way. For Hollywood, and all trick photography and special effects. Spiritualists loved the phonograph, instrument for recording sound. This was able to capture the voice and play it back. If someone who had made a recording then died, their voice could be played back. For the first time in history, people could literally listen to the dead. People found this incredibly spooky and moving, the voice of the dead passed. The voices of the dead could now be preserved. That then automatically inspired another thought, the dead have voices and we can speak to them if we have the right technology. Some people even wondered if the voices of the long dead were in some way encoded all around us, imprinted in the environment, and could be captured and played back. We could perhaps listen to Socrates, Alexander the Great, Caesar, if we could just invent the right device. Everything was thought possible. The hive mind serves as the perfect basis for spiritualism and mediumship. All minds are located in the singularity, right beside each other, and all can communicate with each other. You can talk to your dead loved ones, and when you die your living ones will be able to talk to you. Of course, the dead aren't dead forever. They keep coming back, via reincarnation. They are the revenants, the returners. SPR the Society for Psychical Research, SPR, avoided claims about the possibility of communication with the dead and instead stuck to slightly safer ground, concentrating on the phenomenon of mental transfer, although if living minds can mentally transfer thoughts, why not the living and the dead? In the 19th century, X-rays and wireless telecommunications were so mysterious and amazing that they stimulated incredible supernatural fantasies. People imagined a whole cosmology of invisible forces, waves, rays, interconnecting fluids, telepathic connections, mental transfers, you name it. Just as the medieval world went mad for witchcraft and demons, the Victorian world did for spirits. Telepathic communication with spirits in some invisible dimension suddenly seemed eminently possible. The term telepathy was coined by Frederick Myers, a member of the SPR, to cover all cases of impressions received at a distance without the Normal operation of the recognized sense organs. Many researchers believed there had to be some physical intermediation between the transmitter and the receiver, otherwise thought transference would remain mystical, and could not be treated scientifically. The model that then started to be envisaged was that minds could communicate, wirelessly, over the ether, just as electromagnetism was thought to operate. 
If a Marconi message, a wireless telegraph signal, could be sent across a distance, across an ocean even, why shouldn't the mind do the same? The spectator wrote, why, in fact, if one wire can talk to another without connections, save through ether, should not mind talk to mind without any wire at all? Everyone thought this was eminently plausible. Within psychical research, the analogy between mind and wireless became extremely influential. Renowned scientist Oliver Lodge, one of the pioneers of wireless technology, was convinced of the link between wireless and telepathy. Lodge said, just as the energy of an electric charge, though apparently on the conductor, is not on the conductor, but in all the space around it, so it may be that the sensory consciousness of a person, though apparently located in the brain, may also be conceived of as also existing like a faint echo in space, or in other brains. Lodge was convinced he would be able to detect invisible energies and even invisible realms. Lodge was eager to link electromagnetic waves, which made wireless technology possible, with his theories about the ether, which he defined as, the universal connecting medium which binds the universe together. The ether was always conceived physically. The great secret is that it is in fact mental, hence unextended and not in space and time at all. Invisible ether resolved the apparent puzzle that wireless worked. Without any visible channel. It was obvious that occultism and psychical research would see the analogies and possibilities of invisible media. Röntgen's mysterious X-rays were able to pass through clothes and skin, allowing observers to see into the interior of a human body. Such rays promised to demonstrate the activity of invisible forces in our world, and one could only wonder at what other invisible force might be discovered, with even more incredible properties. This all reflected the Victorians' love of science combined with their passion for the paranormal. Their obsession with ghosts and the supernatural was linked to an increasing belief that science, with its amazing new discoveries, could open the door to learning the secrets of the afterlife. Film scholar Yuri Tsivian said, cultural expectations aroused by the X-ray exceeded anything that could be observed in connection with other scientific discoveries of the time. The magic of X-rays, and the spooky images they generated, brought to mind images of ghosts, hauntings, and all manner of other occult fantasies. In a sexually repressed age, men were overcome with the possibility of seeing through women's clothes. Enterprising clothes manufacturers then rushed out X-ray-proof underclothing for the most modest ladies. Others imagined that X-rays were connected to alchemy and could transform base metal into gold. X-rays were not only able to pass through opaque surfaces, it was found that they could also burn the human body and cause lesions. X-rays became a terrible power, able to kill or cure. In 1896, a journalist reported that X-rays had been used to project anatomic diagrams directly into the brain of medical students, making a much more lasting impression than ordinary teaching methods. A story was told of an English scientist who took an X-ray picture of his own brain while thinking of a dead child. When he developed the plate, he supposedly found a faint impression of the child. If X-rays could see through bodies, maybe they could see through minds too and reveal their secrets. Writer Maxim Gorky imagined X-ray. Photography disclosing the inside of one's mind, imagine that someone wants to know you better. He takes a picture of your skull, and if the skull contains some thoughts, the negative will reveal them as black spots, or smoke-like spirals, or some other unattractive form. If he wishes, he can try to photograph your conscience, and the negative will also show all the excrescences and blots. In a word, every person will be seen through now, and however thick and impenetrable your skin might be, the new light makes it transparent like glass. Could X-rays serve as lie detectors? Could they reveal the truth whether you liked it or not? At the end of the 18th century in France, Franz Anton Mesmer claimed to be able to influence the balance of powers that regulates the health of every individual. He claimed to stimulate a vital fluid, some kind of magnetic fluid, which supposedly pervaded the entire universe, and which needed to be kept in balance, like the force in Star Wars. Occultists claimed that vital fluids could be recorded by means of a photographic plate. As in the case of X-ray photography, the plate had to be exposed directly, without the aid of a camera. Some people tried to perform medication at distance, 
using magnets to transfer diseases through the stimulation of invisible forces. Some believe that thoughts and feelings produce various radiations and, like X-rays, these radiations could be recorded on a photographic plate. Many researchers believed they had entered a remarkable new scientific age where we could start to penetrate into the domain of the invisible, via the sensitive photographic plate French writer Gustave Le Bon researched a force he called lumière noire, black light, a kind of energy that was different to the X-rays but could likewise pass through opaque bodies and be captured on a photographic plate. Supporters of spirit photography believed it was possible to capture a picture of the spirits of the dead. The Victorians imagined a vibrant world of invisible rays all around us, not detectable by the human senses but having powerful effects on reality. The world of the hive mind is everything they ever dreamt of. Mind theft? Mark Twain wrote, I could not doubt, there was no tenable reason for doubting, that Mr. Wright's mind and mine had been in close and crystal clear communication with each other across 3,000 miles of mountain and desert on the morning of the 2nd of March. I did not consider that both minds originated that succession of ideas, but that one mind originated it, and simply telegraphed it to the other. I was curious to know which brain was the telegrapher and which the receiver, so I wrote and asked for particulars. Mr. Wright's reply showed that his mind had done the originating and telegraphing, and mine the receiving. Mark that significant thing now, consider for a moment how many a splendid, original idea has been unconsciously stolen from a man 3,000 miles away. Consider, the frequency with which the same machine or other contrivance has been invented at the same time by several persons in different quarters. Of the globe. The world was without an electric telegraph for several. Thousand years, then Professor Henry, the American, Wheatstone in England, Morse on the sea, and a German in Munich, all invented it at the same time. The discovery of certain ways of applying steam was made in two or three countries in the same year. Is it not possible that inventors are constantly and unwittingly stealing each other's ideas whilst they stand thousands of miles asunder? Some people can reach into the minds of others, or have their own mind reached into. Most people have no such capacity. They aren't intuitive enough. The intuitive mind is the opposite of the sensing mind. The latter is designed for maximizing space-time interaction, the latter for non-space-time, singularity, interaction. Intuitive minds are the ones that interact as if space-time wasn't there at all. Twain went on, I have never seen any mesmeric or clairvoyant performances or spiritual manifestations which were in the least degree convincing, a fact which is not of consequence, since my opportunities have been meager, but I am forced to believe that one human mind, still inhabiting the flesh, can communicate with another, over any sort of a distance, and without any artificial preparation of, sympathetic conditions to act as a transmitting agent. I suppose that when the sympathetic conditions happen to exist the two minds communicate with each other, and that otherwise they don't, and I suppose that if the sympathetic conditions could be kept up right along, the two minds would continue to correspond without limit as to time. And could the two minds keep in touch even after one of the participants had physically died? In the mathematics of the hive mind, there is nothing to prevent it. What is the paranormal? It's everything that can't be explained in. Terms of space, time and matter. Since science is based on nothing but space, time and matter, there is no means for science to explain the paranormal, so it's dismissed by science, as so many things are, as delusion, invention, superstition, and ignorance. However, as soon as you introduce a Holonmeric singularity into science, an instant mechanism exists to explain all paranormal activities. Twain wrote, while I am writing this, doubtless somebody on the other side of the globe is writing it, too. The question is, am I inspiring him or is he inspiring me? I cannot answer that, but that these thoughts have been passing through somebody else's mind all the time I have been setting them down I have no sort of doubt. Hmm, is someone else stealing our work and passing it off as their own? What do you think? Gotcha. Deja vu. Mark Twain offered a fascinating explanation of déjà vu. He wrote, Now there is that curious thing which happens to everybody, suddenly a succession of thoughts or sensations flocks in upon you, 
which startles you with the weird idea that you have ages ago experienced just this succession of thoughts or sensations in a previous existence. The previous existence is possible, no doubt, but I am persuaded that the solution of this hoary mystery lies not there, but in the fact that some far-off stranger has been telegraphing his thoughts and sensations into your consciousness, and that he stopped because some countercurrent or other obstruction intruded and broke the line of communication. Perhaps they seem repetitions to you because they are repetitions, got it second-hand from the other man. Possibly Mr. Brown, that the mind reader, reads other people's minds, possibly he does not, but I know of a surety that I have read another man's mind, and therefore I do not see why Mr. Brown shouldn't do the like also. Like Carl Jung, Twain must have been a remarkable intuitive. To sensing types, intuitives are weird mystics and shamans. They just don't get it. All oracles were intuitives. Autistics, who exist at the far end of the sensing spectrum, have no intuition at all. There was never an autistic oracle. No scientist is qualified to be an oracle. Music therapy It has been found that the brains of a patient and therapist become synchronized during a music therapy session. This improves the interaction, the rapport, between them. Music therapists seek to accomplish moments of change. At these points, they make a meaningful connection with their patient and a therapeutic breakthrough becomes possible. In one study, the patient's brain activity shifted suddenly from displaying deep negative feelings to a positive peak. The therapist's brain scan displayed similar results. Both identified that as a moment and they felt the therapy was really working. We all feel better when we synchronize, when we harmonize. That's why anomics and trolls are aggravating. They disrupt the whole pattern. Jorg Fackner, professor of music, health and the brain at Anglia Ruskin University, said, this study is a milestone in music therapy research. Music therapists report experiencing emotional changes and connections during therapy, and we've been able to confirm this using data. From the brain. Music, used therapeutically, can improve well-being and treat conditions including anxiety, depression, autism, and dementia. Music therapists have had to rely on the patient's response to judge whether this is working, but by using hyperscanning we can see exactly what is happening in the patient's brain. Hyperscanning can show the tiny, otherwise imperceptible, changes that take place during therapy. By highlighting the precise points where sessions have worked best, it could be particularly useful when treating patients for whom verbal communication is challenging. Our findings could also help to better understand emotional processing in other therapeutic interactions. The Mind Reader Mark Twain wrote, but here are two or three incidents which come strictly under the head of mind telegraphing. One Monday morning, about a year ago, the mail came in, and I picked up one of the letters and said to a friend, without opening this letter I will tell you what it says. It is from Mrs. X, and she says she was in New York last Saturday and was purposing to run up here in the afternoon train and surprise us, but at the last moment changed her mind and returned westward to her home. I was right, my details were exactly correct. Yet we had had no suspicion that Mrs. X was coming to New York, or that she had even a remote intention of visiting us. I think I know now that mind can communicate accurately with mind without the aid of the slow and clumsy vehicle of speech. Scientists are sensing types. They are people who have a practically religious devotion to materialism and empiricism, i.e. the foundations of the sensing worldview. Who, then, could be worse paranormal investigators? Then scientists, the very people with no paranormal powers or potentialities? The keys. Dreams are the most mysterious things there are. That's why they are key to unlocking all the mysteries of existence. Once you understand how dreams originate, what originates them, what constructs them and how they are manufactured, and why they take on the special character they do, you know everything about reality. It's not science that helps us to understand dreams, it's psychology, philosophy, and, above all, mathematics. The secrets of dreams give us access to powers today's humanity can barely imagine, but which ancient humanity may have enjoyed to an incredibly high degree to such an extent that they believed they were in direct contact with angels and gods. Can we bring back direct contact with the numinous order?
Come inside and find out why we lost our dream abilities, our superhuman abilities, and how we can recover them. Dreams When we are awake, we have a common world but when we dream, everybody has his own. Heraclitus in a dream, you never see the dreamer. You never see the sleeping person. You see everything except that. The eye cannot see the eye and the dreamer cannot see the dreamer. Similarly, the cosmic mind, the hive mind, that produced the world, does not see itself. It sees only its construction, the cosmos, the world. We all know that a dreamer must exist in order to produce a dream world. Dreams do not make themselves. Why, therefore, does humanity not grasp that a cosmic mind must exist in order to produce the cosmos? The ancients understood this. Modern science does not. Even though Big Bang Theory says that the universe came from a singularity, it refuses to accept that this singularity was, and remains, a cosmic mind. Never forget, you see the dream world, not the dreamer, you see the construct, not the constructor, you see the world, not the world builder. This proves catastrophic for science. Science is based on observation. Which automatically means that it focuses on the construct and not the constructor, whose existence it in fact denies, since it is unobservable, hence beyond the scientific method and outside the scientific paradigm. The world builder is the unseen cosmic mind, made of unseen monadic minds, the cells of the hive. The Big Bang was nothing but an explosion of dream content from every individual monadic mind to create a single, collective dream, aka the world. The Frenophone Telephone means, far voice. With a telephone, you hear a voice that's far away. What about a frenophone? This means, mind voice. Is it possible to invent a device that allows you to hear another person's thoughts? Mark Twain wrote, This age does seem to have exhausted invention nearly, still, it has one important contract on its hands yet, the invention of the frenophone, that is to say, a method whereby the communicating of mind with mind may be brought under command and reduced to certainty in system. The telegraph and the telephone are going to become too slow and wordy for our needs. We must have the thought itself shot into our minds from a distance, then, if we need to put it into words, we can do that tedious work at our leisure. Doubtless the something which conveys our thoughts through the air from brain to brain is a finer and subtler form of electricity, and all we need do is to find out how to capture it and how to force it to do its work, as we have had to do in the case of the electric. Currents. Before the day of telegraphs neither one of these marvels would have seemed any easier to achieve than the other. In the hive world, everything is based on waves, the music of nature, and everything positive is seeking to increase synchronization and unity, while all toxic, negative forces are seeking to increase disharmony and chaos. We have certainly come across our fair share of trolls and anomics, all seeking to silence the divine music of the spheres. The Dream Big Bang. Imagine that we have two modes of dreaming, private and public, sleeping and waking. In the latter case we are still in fact sleeping, but we are all asleep together rather than individually, and our sense organs are active as opposed to being quiescent. When we are asleep individually, our conscious mind is conscious of the content generated by our unconscious mind, and we don't need sense organs. When we are asleep collectively, our conscious mind is conscious of the content generated by the collective unconscious rather than the personal unconscious, and we do need sense organs. This is a transpersonal and objective experience, as opposed to personal and subjective, so has a drastically different quality and seems much more real. Also, we are now using our sense organs in conjunction with our minds rather than simply our minds. In fact, reality is a question of degree, not of kind. The real world is no different in principle from a dream world, except far more minds. Indeed all minds, contribute to it and thus stabilize and anchor it, giving it the properties we all experience. Yet all of us are capable of sensing that there is something very, unreal, about reality, we often intuit that its true nature is that of a glorified dream. Many even believe that it is a simulation, that we are in some sort of cosmic video game. Many people go mad, which is to say they start mixing subjective dreaming with objective dreaming, leading to total meltdown. 
If you don't know which dream world you're in, private or public, you're in real trouble. Evolution spends a lot of time separating the two separate dream systems. That's why during REM sleep, the sleep phase where most recalled dreams occur, your eyes continue to move but the rest of the body's muscles are stopped. You are effectively paralyzed to stop your body, which is still present in the collective dream, from doing anything in response to what your mind is dreaming of in its private dream space. If you got these signals confused, it would lead to chaos. The trichotomy. Henry Thomas Buckle said, men and women range themselves into three classes or orders of intelligence, you can tell the lowest class by their habit of always talking about persons, the next by the fact that their habit is always to converse about things, the highest by their preference for the discussion of ideas. This descending trichotomy of ideas, events, and people was later simplified as, great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds discuss people. In Jungian terms, we could express this as, great minds are thinking and intuitive types and discuss ideas, average minds are sensing types and discuss things and events, and small minds are feeling types and discuss people. Great minds are sages, average minds are scientists, and small minds are religious believers and gossips. Our books are full of the biggest ideas possible, but what do we find, pathetic people gossiping about us and trying to do us down? Know thyself. The Dream Clash Think of a private dream as a private Big Bang. Your mind alone is in charge of it. Your dream world erupts out of your mind, and returns to it at the end, via a big crunch. Now imagine that the Big Bang which physics describes is actually a collision of the dreams of all the minds in existence. They all dream at once, in the same mental space, and their dreams all collide with each other to produce the most fantastic dream explosion. The collective dream then filters out all subjective, individual elements, leaving nothing but what is common to all the dreams. This turns out to be what we call matter, the psychoid layer of reality, but it is actually basic mathematics, common to all minds, built into all minds. The world is the most objective place because it is the simplest, most universal expression of mathematics. The evolution of the universe is the evolution of a common dream space, with which we all interact. It's conducted at a mathematical level. Performed by the collective unconscious, the divine mathematician, the best mathematician of all, the composer of the music of the spheres. Dream telepathy. According to the theory of dream telepathy, people can communicate with each other while dreaming. To test the theory, an experiment was established that required a sender and a receiver. They met each other just before going to sleep then went to their separate rooms. The sender was given an envelope instructing him what to think about during his sleep. The receiver was then purposely awakened and asked to report his dream, to see if it matched the sleep instructions given to the sender. The hypothesis was that humans can be made to dream selectively about randomly picked material. Equally, you could tell someone to dream about something specific before they go sleep and see if they do. Or they themselves can choose a topic to dream about and see if they then do. Extending the experiment to other people, dream telepathy can be explored. In one experiment, the sender was shown the print of School of Dance, by Edgar Degas, showing several women in a dance class. When the receiver submitted his dream report, he had written, I was in a school where around ten people were there. One little girl was trying to dance with me. There is some level of dream telepathy even among total strangers, but it goes up in intensity as the participants are more intimately known to each other. Lovers and identical twins show the most ability. Intuitives are much better at dream telepathy than non-intuitives. The quantum hive. The hive mind is a natural quantum mind. All minds are wave systems and operate via wave functions. All minds in the hive are interconnected. This means that all sorts of different situations, different connections, different relationships are possible. 1. Minds can operate individually. 2. Minds can operate collectively, as the whole monadic ensemble. 3. Minds can operate in random groups. 4. Minds can operate in concerted groups. 5. 
minds can operate in very small groups of sixes, fives, fours, threes. Six, minds can operate in twos, the most intimate connection. Dream telepathy is most commonly associated with the sixth scenario. Imagine minds as having windows which they can open or close, and they can shutter all the windows. A fully closed mind has closed and shuttered all of its windows. Nothing can get in or out. It's entirely self-contained. The monads can also remove the shutters, throw open all the windows and fully interact with each other. They can then build a whole universe together. But minds can also selectively open some windows and keep others closed. They can open the windows to targeted minds and exclude other minds. This is how mental telepathy is possible. The key thing you have to understand about the hive mind is that all the minds are actually singularities and they are all together in one super singularity. Because they are all singularities, they are all together. There is nothing separating any two singularities within the super singularity. In space and time, we are all linked to bodies physically separated from each other. In the singularity, which is not in space and time, our minds are not separated at all. There is no distance to travel. Telepathy in space and time terms would involve having to traverse distance by some means. Outside space and time, it involves no distance at all, so tele drops out. It's just one mind directly linking to another that's mathematically right next to it. The hive mind solves every problem of the supernatural, the paranormal and the ether because it eliminates space and time from consideration and allows minds to interface directly outside space and time. All they have to do is choose to interact or break in using special techniques, as exemplified by the movie Inception. Scientists went looking for a physical ether. There was no such thing. The ether was always mental, hence why science never detected it, no matter how hard it tried. The ether was said to connect everything. In fact, everything is connected in the mental ether because it's an immaterial singularity. Outside space and time. S.H. wrote, had a telepathic experience via lucid dreaming, confirmed with the other person. Can you explain that mathematically please? Telepathy is a misnomer. We are in fact all in automatic mental contact with each other, but at the level of the collective unconscious. With lucid dreaming, we can bring unconscious links between minds into consciousness. Mathematically, our minds are all in a singularity, so we don't have to travel any distance at all to link to other minds. Bodies are separated by distance, because they are in space and time. Minds are not separated by distance, because they are not in space and time, they are in a singularity. Our minds actually have to work hard to shield themselves from other minds. At the level of the collective unconscious, there is no shielding, and all minds are linked to each other. Hive The human hive, the amazing world of dreams hive dreaming. There's nothing like it. In the movie Inception, the protagonist Cobb says, well, imagine you're designing a building. You consciously create each aspect. But sometimes it feels like it's almost creating itself, if you know what I mean. Genuine inspiration, right? Now, in a dream, our mind continuously does this. We create and perceive our world simultaneously, and our mind does this so well that we don't even know it's happening. This is an astute point. In a private dream, we do indeed create and perceive simultaneously. In a public dream, we don't. The collective mind creates the world and then we all perceive it individually, from our own perspective, using our sense organs, feelings, and intuitions. Cobb goes on, that allows us to get right in the middle of that process. By taking over the creative part. Now this is where I need you. You. Create the world of the dream. We bring the subject into that dream, and. They fill it with their subconscious. The movie, the best movie of ideas since The Matrix, was based on the idea that one person, the architect, could design a collective dream world which several dreaming people could then inhabit, especially the subject of the dream, i.e. the person from whom something was wanted. An architect is like a video game designer with the dream representing different levels within the game. 
The film depicts dreams within dreams, and a base dream level known as limbo, which is like a blank collective unconscious. In the movie, there are three types of roles for people to assume in shared dreams, dreamer, the dreamer creates and maintains the dream space. The architect usually fulfills the role of the dreamer, but the architect can also teach their designs to another to dream, hence need not be the dreamer. Subject, the subject, the person to whom extraction of information or inception of information is being applied, populates the dream space with projections of their subconscious. Other sleepers, sleepers are those that can participate in the dream, but they cannot alter the fundamental structure of the dream. Only the dreamer can do that. Cobb says, they say we only use a fraction of our brain's true potential. That's when we're awake. When we're asleep, our mind can do almost anything. You can indeed do anything you like in your private space. As more and more people are involved with a dream, you can do less and less. When all minds are involved in the dream then we are dealing with none other than the objective world, where our options in day-to-day -day life are very restricted. According to Inception, the subject's subconscious populates the dreamer's world and inserts people, which are its own projections, and these can serve as useful sources of additional information. Cobb says, That's one way we get at a subject's thoughts, his mind creates the people, so we can literally talk to his subconscious. The projections have another property, they can hunt down the dreamer. Cobb says, the projections are looking at you because you're changing things. My subconscious feels that someone else is creating the world. The more you change things, the quicker the projections converge on you. They feel the foreign nature of the dreamer, an attack, like white blood cells fighting an infection. Ariadne says, they're going to attack us, to which Cobb replies, just you, actually. Inception is all about hacking the mind via hacking dreams. It's the first hive mind movie. Carl Jung wrote, Synchronicity is the coming together of inner and outer events in a way that cannot be explained by cause and effect and that is meaningful to the observer. In terms of the hive mind, synchronicity operates via the singularity, hence bypasses spacetime. It obeys mental causation, not physical causation. Ultimately, there is only mind. The physical world is a mere mental projection. The outer world is as connected to the inner world as a dream is to a dreamer. Synchronicity proves that we live in mental universe. Cause and effect are fully at play, mental cause and physical effect. K.H. wrote, I have worshipped a goddess in Wicca who can create and enter dreams. I love dream magic, so useful. Can the gods enter anyone's dreams? Are they the dream architects? Can gods create or enter your dreams if they want to pass on a message to you? S.B. said, What a week. I can't believe it's another week down. It's gone super fast. How does time go so fast when we're mega busy? Isn't it so fucking weird how time speeds up, slows down, yet always stays the same? Like, time with you is over so fast it's unreal. Time with Josh in the office trying to make small talk and pretend I'm remotely interested in his life feels like 5 hours when it was about 12 minutes. Why does time speed up and slow down, eh? It really is just a concept, isn't it? Time in the private dream is completely unregulated. Time in the public dream is completely regulated, always passing at the same rate. Psychological time passes depending on our degree of interest and pleasure. If we're having a great time, it flashes past. If we're having a bad time, it crawls past. We can't wait to be out of there. The collective I. A single I creates a single world. A collective I creates a collective world. The hive mind is a collective I, the ultimate superego, the divine superego, the divine self, the unity of all things. The world created by an individual mind is a private dream world. The world created by the collective mind is the public objective world. The world is simply a collective dream. In a private dream, we are up against only one mind, our own. We can change things at will. In a public dream, we are up against all minds. We can't change things at will. That's why it has a completely different quality. 
that's why it's much more objective. In a dream, people reify their own mental creations and then experience them as matter. The material world itself is simply the reification of the mental creations of all minds. Why is quantum mechanics so weird? It's because it destroys the central notion of materialism, that things are made of hard, solid, lumps. Anything that does not portray matter in those terms has ceased to be. Materialism Science has ceased to be materialism, yet goes on calling itself materialism anyway. It makes absolutely no attempt to redefine its paradigm, even though its paradigm is now incoherent. Quantum mechanics, based on waves, is consistent with mental reality, not material reality. It's consistent with the interconnected hive mind. Objective time versus subjective time is quantitative time versus qualitative time, material, time versus psychological time. Imagine scientists investigating a person's dreams. How does the dream form? At one point, there is no dream at all, and the next there is. The dream Big Bang, we might say. How would scientists study it? Would they be able to trace it all the way back to the mind that dreamt it, the state preceding the dream Big Bang? No chance. Isn't it extraordinary that people would rather believe in matter than in mathematics? Why are they so repulsed by mathematics, and so convinced that matter is real and mathematics isn't? What is that makes people imagine that mathematics can't exist and matter can? Scientists don't even accept the existence of mind. How weird is it for minds to deny their own existence? That's a mental illness. The 40 Days The Temptation of Christ is a biblical narrative detailed in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. After being baptized by John the Baptist, Jesus fasted for 40 days and nights in the Judean desert. During this time, Satan appeared to Jesus and tried to tempt him. Jesus having refused each temptation, Satan then departed and Jesus returned to Galilee to begin his ministry. Wikipedia Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness before his ministry and then 40 days with his disciples after his ministry, after he was executed and resurrected. The question is, why did the Romans, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the high priest, the temple guard, their spies and informers, and the people in general, not notice? Why did no one say, hey, isn't that the dead guy? Why didn't Pontius Pilate say, didn't we just crucify that bloke? I could have sworn we did. Silly me. Being stared at. Who hasn't had the sensation of feeling they were being stared at and then looking up and discovering that, sure enough, someone was looking intently straight at them? This is the most basic level of telepathy. By staring at you in space and time, this person's mind has interacted with yours outside space and time in the hive mind and that's why you experience the strange sensation and react to it. If scientific materialism were true, you would have no clue anyone was looking at you. You would never look up. There would be no such sensation. Think. I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore my dream world is. We think, therefore we are. We think, therefore our world is, the objective world. I, the dreamer, posits the not I, the dream. We, the collective dreamer, posit the not we, the universe. In terms of inception, the architect is also the dreamer and is the collective mind, populating the world with archetypes. All of us are the sleepers and subjects. All of our secrets are being extracted, or inserted, inception. Dream Hormones do we secrete dream hormones? Can we concentrate dream hormones and have even more powerful dreams, dreams where we have the power of gods? Are archetypes available to allow us to dream better, bigger, more powerful dreams? Can we turn dream hormones on and off? Could we eliminate the capacity to dream by suppressing dream hormones? BP wrote, is our mind generating the external reality in this dream or simply perceiving the external stimuli? The mind of course does both, unless we were in some inception-like situation where we were sitting in on someone else's dream. The Mandarin Conspiracy Did you love our latest Joe Dixon book? It caused quite the stir. It unmasked the conspirators, it flushed them out. 
It left them red-faced and raging, shaking their fists futilely at the heavens. You have no idea how deep the rabbit hole goes, the extent of the conspiracy. Our webpage about the Mandarin conspiracy reveals all. There you will discover the guilty parties. Will you find your own face in the gallery of high traders? Many will. To each we say, we separate him from the society of all Illuminists, we exclude him from the bosom of our illuminated brotherhood and sisterhood, we declare him excommunicated and anathematized and we judge him condemned to eternal fire with Satan and his angels and all the reprobate. By Cameralism Psychologist Julian Jaynes proposed one of the most remarkable ideas of all time, the hypothesis of bicameralism. He wrote, the preposterous hypothesis we have come to, is that at one time human nature was split in two, an executive part called a god, and a follower part called a man. Neither part was conscious. This is almost incomprehensible to us. According to Jaynes, the god resided in the right hemisphere of the brain and the follower in the left hemisphere. In terms of the hive mind, we can envisage a situation where the collective unconscious is the god in the right hemisphere, and it supplies archetypal instructions to the personal unconscious in the left hemisphere. Through the interaction of the collective and personal unconscious, and the effect of archetypes, the personal unconscious gradually evolves a personal consciousness, the ego. Once the ego exists, it no longer needs the voice of the collective unconscious, so the god vanishes. Yet how can you do? Without the god? So, the ego then becomes obsessed with finding the god. Again, hence religion, mysticism and philosophy, and even science. What the ego wants to do is unite with the self, which is both its higher self, and also the direct link to god, the collective unconscious. By cameralism, the hive mind and Jungian psychology all fit together perfectly. This will become the default model for the operations of the psyche, once humanity escapes from the clutches of nihilistic materialism. The hypothesis of the bicameral mind is completely attuned to dream reality. Today, people see reality in terms of individual consciousness. Bicameralism by contrast was, above all, about the collective unconscious, manifesting as, God, and linking through the right hemisphere. Bicameral humanity was like an ant colony, with the king, shaman or tribal leader serving as the colony leader, directing operations. There was very little individualism. Did the tribe, operating as a collective mind under the direction of God, have much greater powers than those that exist today? Did the collective will achieve wonders and miracles? Remember, in hive mind theory, all of reality is a dream, and so, if the dreamers want to change it, they can. When Moses parted the Red Sea, was he actually channeling the collective mental power of hundreds of thousands of terrified Hebrews, all attuned to his mind? One researcher has shown that a very powerful wind directed at one shallow strip of the Red Sea could cause a parting of the sea at that point. Did the collective Hebrew mind, under Moses' guidance, create a wind that parted the sea, and then cease the wind when they were all clear, causing the parted sea to rush back in on itself and destroy Pharaoh's pursuing army? This was no miracle by the Hebrew God, but simply a demonstration of the mind-boggling power of the collective bicameral mind. We have barely scratched the true potentialities of mind, especially in the context of its collective operations. These are of course completely denied by scientific materialism, which doesn't strictly speaking even accept the existence of mind. For science, only matter truly exists. Remember, the world is a collective dream, and we are its dreamers, hence we can change it, if we all cooperate. Nothing is more important than the realization that we can literally alter a material reality with our minds, but we have to collaborate or we can achieve nothing. Just as the individual mind can change an individual dream effortlessly, the collective mind can effortlessly the change the collective dream, but only if minds are indeed working collectively, with common, directed intent. Were the ten plagues the product of the collective Hebrew mind's desire to be free? Were the pyramids, astonishing constructs that would be difficult for modern humans to build, actually produced by workers with superhuman strength and precision, because they were under collective mental control and using collective strength? Look at ants in their colonies. They can do unbelievable things. 
Were humans once a super-sophisticated version of ants? Did they act in vast swarms with special collective powers that modern humanity has totally lost because everyone is now so individualistic and cut off from the collective? How did Stone Age people build something as incredible as Stonehenge? How did they move vast rocks vast distances? Many mysteries of the past would make more sense if some factor was involved that has since disappeared. That factor was collective mind, conferring extra power on every individual in the collective. Nothing can match the strength of the dreaming of the tribe, the strength of the dream leader, the orchestrator, the conductor, the shaman, the witch, channeling and focusing the collective power. Nothing can match the power of unity and wholeness, everyone operating as one. In Star Trek, the Borg act as a supremely powerful collective. They are cybernetic organisms, linked in a hive mind called the Collective. Their single mind is represented by the Borg Queen. Were the Jews under Moses like an ancient human Borg? Was the ultimate collective civilization that of Atlantis? Did it develop powers so awesome that it self-destructed? Did that event change the course of evolution and give rise to individualism rather than collectivism, to sensing types rather than intuitives? Have we all lost incredible powers we once all enjoyed? Can we recover them? Hypnosis is inception. If you can steal an idea from someone's mind, why can't you plant one there instead? Saito, inception, in hypnosis, a powerful conscious mind talks to a weak unconscious mind. Hypnosis involves lowering the conscious mind's defenses, thus allowing an external, dominant mind to talk directly to the unconscious mind. In normal functioning, the unconscious mind is always feeding the conscious mind with a large number of possibilities. The conscious mind is the filter, the selector, the judge of what to do. If the unconscious mind has been seated by a hypnotist with a very powerful idea, the conscious mind can easily be duped into obeying it. This is inception, the birth of a thought, as if it came from the person's own unconscious, rather than as a constructed suggestion. The conscious mind is bypassed by hypnotism, and also in bicameralism. Hypnosis is in fact a regression to bicameralism. The likes of Hitler and Trump exercise a kind of hypnosis over impressionable, susceptible minds. They bypass the neocortex and consciousness and reach the emotional limbic system and the primordial, bestial brain stem. Self-hypnosis Religion is a kind of self-hypnosis. You internalize it. It becomes your identity. Your consciousness is then constructed by the religion. Your thoughts have ceased to be your own. The likes of Christians, Jews and Muslims are not conscious beings. They are the nodes of a virus, the religious virus that has infected them and taken them over. Religion hardwires itself into your inception system you become capable of having only those thoughts compatible with your religious faith. Everything else gets pushed into the shadow, where it becomes monstrous and is then projected onto everyone who does not share your religious beliefs. Are dreams self-hypnosis? Does your unconscious mind hypnotize your conscious mind and give it all kinds of crazy things to do? Nothing is more powerful than your unconscious mind, the deep you. And nothing at all is more powerful than the collective unconscious. It is none other than God, the supra-self. The Voodoo Doll A voodoo doll is a doll made to resemble a person in order to cast spells on them, or to harm them by harming the doll. Voodoo, seen as a version of telepathy, is perfectly explained by the hive mind. Voodoo works by opening the mind of the desired victim to the malevolent intent of the person casting the spells. The more the victim believes in voodoo, the more susceptible they are to it. Say yes. Say yes to the cosmos. Say yes to the hive mind. You are an essential part of it. Positive thinking will make your own life positive. It will make the hive positive. The hive mind is a kind of hell at the moment because it is so riven by conflict, selfishness, greed, negativity, entropy in all of its destructive forms. Pay it forward. Don't look for payback. Have you seen a lottery machine where all the numbered balls jump around in the rotating sphere, or whatever else is used to mix them up? Then some of the numbered balls get chosen and someone wins the lottery. 
The hive mind is a bit like that. There's a huge amount of entropic activity, but certain monadic minds are chosen as winners. Here's the question. Do the winners come out randomly, or are they actually chosen by the hive? Does the hive pluck one of us out from obscurity? Does it arrange the lottery balls? Imagine a world of mind balls, like golf balls. That would be the ultimate golf. Anyone for a hole in one? Dream enhancement. Wikipedia says, an onirogen, from the Greek oniros meaning a dream, and gen, to create, is that which produces or enhances dreamlike states of consciousness. This is characterized by an immersive dream state similar to REM sleep, which can range from realistic to alien or abstract. Many dream-enhancing plants such as dream herb and African dream herb, as well as the hallucinogenic diviner's sage, have been used for thousands of years in a form of divination through dreams, called oniromancy, in which practitioners seek to receive psychic or prophetic information during dream states. The term onirogen commonly describes a wide array of psychoactive plants and chemicals ranging from normal dream enhancers to intense dissociative or deliriant drugs. Effects experienced with the use of onirogens may include microsleep, hypnagogia, fugue states, rapid eye movement sleep, REM, hypnic jerks, lucid dreams, and out of body. Experiences Some onirogenic substances are said to have little to no effect on waking consciousness, and will not exhibit their effects until the user falls into a natural sleep state. The science of sleep and in particular the science of dreaming is in its infancy. Given that all we do is continuously switch between private and public dreaming, dreaming is the key to everything, to the entire operations of the hive mind, which is nothing but a dreaming entity. In Greek mythology, the lotus eaters were a race of people living on an island dominated by the lotus plant the fruits and flowers of which provided the primary food supply of the island. However, they were also a narcotic, and caused the inhabitants to spend most of their time sleeping in peaceful apathy. Myths Joseph Campbell said, Myths are public dreams, dreams are private myths. The world is a public dream. Conventional dreams are private dreams. Joseph Campbell said, We must be willing to get rid of the life we planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. How many people are ready? As every general knows, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. You must be ready to react. Campbell wrote, I have bought this wonderful machine, a computer, it seems to me to be an Old Testament god, with a lot of rules and no mercy. Do people worship their computers? Do they kneel and pray to them? At least they're a lot more useful than the Abrahamic god. F. H. Bradley wrote, the contention that our waking world is the one real order of things, is based on ignorance which chooses to take itself for knowledge. Exactly. The hive mind knows very differently. F. H. Bradley wrote, S. Oppose that in hypnotism, madness, or dream. My world becomes wider and more harmonious than the scheme which is. Set up for my normal self, then does, I ask. What I dream become at once a world better and more real? Objective, collective dreaming is reality. Subjective, individual dreaming is what we aspire to. We need to bring the two into better alignment for the benefit of us all. Conclusion For the hive mind to function properly, every member of the hive needs to understand what is going on. Only then can it do its proper job. We can have the dreams of the gods. We can build heaven on earth. Unfortunately, if people don't comprehend what the hive mind truly is and their place in it is then we get hell instead. We get this exact world we're in right now, a screwed up hive mind, a hive where the members of the hive have viciously turned on each other. We need to clean out the hive. We need to get it working properly. That means everyone needs to know about this book. Spread the good word.